Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Perth Andover Baptist Church. A special welcome to you if you're watching online. If you don't know who I am, my name is Nathan Drover. I'm the lead pastor here, along with Pastor Sheila, and it is a rainy morning, but a good morning uh, to be here to worship uh, God with you this morning. Uh, This morning we're going to be talking a lot about love, reflecting both on God's love for us and the way that he calls us to love one another. And so to begin our worship uh, service this morning, I want to read out from uh, the first couple verses of Psalm 136. And this psalm, it's uh, really easy to memorize half of this psalm because even though there are 26 verses Literally half of it is just, for his steadfast love endures forever. That refrain repeats over and over and over again in this psalm. So uh, as I read this out, these first uh, five verses or so, if you want to repeat or say the words with me, for his steadfast love endures forever, uh, you are welcome to do that. So the psalm begins, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of gods. For his steadfast love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of Lords, for his steadfast love endures forever. To him who alone does great wonders, for his steadfast love endures forever. To him who by understanding made the heavens, for his steadfast love endures forever. And so this morning we come before the God whose steadfast love endures forever. Uh, And so through the service, we'll worship him through uh, song, through looking at his word, and through prayer. And so let's begin with a word of prayer now. Father, I want to thank you that your steadfast love endures forever. God, even from the time that you created the world till now into eternity, your love will endure. Your faithfulness and mercy will be new every morning. And so, God, I pray that uh, throughout this service, uh, first your name would be glorified through uh, the meditation of our hearts on your word and through the songs that we sing and the prayers that we pray, and as well that you would encounter us here in this moment, that we would meet you and so that our love is deepened and our joy is enriched through our relationship uh, with you. So, God, we pray for you to accomplish these things among us in the name of Jesus by the power of your spirit working here this morning. Amen. If you're able to, I'll invite you to stand to join us in musical worship.
right. I was actually going to invite any kids who want to come up and do all the actions with me for our kids song. You can come up to the front. And I think that means actually everybody can just stand right back up again because we're going to do another song about how God's love never fails. morning. At this time we'll take up our morning tithes and offerings. For those who uh, don't give online, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day you've given us and uh, we thank you for all the blessings you pour down on us each and every day. At this time we give thanks uh, for those who give towards the missions of our uh, church. We ask you to bless each gift and each giver this morning. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Birthdays this week. Today, Madison Chapman has a birthday and Bev Davenport have a birthday. So happy birthday to those today. On Monday, Danny Trites has a birthday and on Friday, Sandy Crabb has a birthday. Just a couple of announcements I'll highlight. There's all kinds in the bulletin here that you can uh, read. Uh, youth group tonight here at the church at 6.30. And uh, River Kids Youth tomorrow night here at the church at 6.30. So for all those that are participating there. Next Sunday, a spaghetti dinner fundraiser for our youth uh, going to OneCon. So uh, this is by donation. And it can either be uh, eat in or take out. So uh, just uh, keep that in mind for next Sunday afternoon. You can have uh, dinner here at the church. Uh, Camp uh, Shiktahawk sponsorship applications are in the lobby, and the deadline is uh, June the 5th, so keep that in mind. And just a note for the 
for the month of August. Uh, our mortgage-free celebration is going to be held on August the 13th with a couple of guest speakers, so keep that in mind. Uh, cabin Shiktahawk uh, cabin cleanup. We have a cabin down at Camp Shiktahawk, and uh, we've been asked to uh, take care of it again this year, so if anyone's interested in helping out with that, uh, see Pastor Nathan. And on the back of your bulletin, you may not have noticed this morning, Jean, that uh, we have an update from the uh, uh, Board of uh, Deacons, what uh, we've been working on and what's coming up. And you can read all those uh, things that's going on. But one thing I wanted to bring to you, your attention was uh, we've had uh, a couple of people come in and take a look at our cemetery. And they're giving us a quote on uh, repairing all the uh, fallen headstones and also looking at the fence, having that repaired as well. And so uh, obviously this is going to uh, cost some money. So if you're uh, interested in uh, donating to the uh, cemetery fund, uh, you can just uh, donate it in a separate envelope, mark a cemetery fund, or uh, if you're doing it online, just mark it in your comments as a cemetery fund. All right, and that's all the announcements I have for today. Morning. Let's go before the Lord in prayer. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we just uh, come before you today giving you thanks and praise for allowing us to come to fellowship with one another and to worship you. We thank you that you allow us to come out freely. Father, this morning we just uh, lift uh, up those who are sick, those who are facing health challenges, Lord, within our families, within our church congregation, within our communities. We just pray, Father, that you would be with them, watch over them, help them to face these challenges, and may they have people by their sides with them. We pray especially for Marianne and Jean as they continue treatments, that you would keep their bodies strong, that you would watch over them and be with them as they continue. Father, we be with those who are mourning, Father, loss, uh, both, both recent and um, long ago. We just pray that you'd help them through their uh, time of mourning and pain. Pray, Father, that uh, they would feel your presence among them. Be with uh, Sheila as, uh, and Sarah as they uh, meet and counsel and uh, encourage uh, people who are going through this. Father, we pray for all of our church ministries. We thank you for everything that's going on, Father. We pray for all the uh, church leaders in each uh, area and for all the volunteers. And we pray for all those that are ministered to, Father, for all the adults, the youth, right down to the kids. And we just pray, Father, that we be found faithful in ministering to them, that they would be uh, drawn closer to you. Father, remember all the students and, Father, um, at all the different levels and age levels and school levels. And we think of the university and college students who are, um, if not done and graduating, are uh, getting close to that process. And we just pray that you be with them. Watch over them this summer and help them to find uh, work if they seek so. Be with our local students in uh, elementary, middle school, and high school as they uh, um, see the finish line. And you would just uh, be with them and watch over them, be with all the teachers as well that they would help them uh, finish through this year. Father, we thank you for our pastors, Nathan and Sheila, and we just pray that you continue to be with them. We lift them up this morning. Help us to uh, work alongside them as they do your ministry's work here. Father, we pray for our community. We just pray that uh, we would be a church, Father, that would show your love, that we would be your feet that go, that we would be your hands that reach out, that we would show... Uh, the love that you've shown to us, to others that we see around us. Father, we just pray for all the world events and all the challenges that are being faced across our um, planet in all the different many countries, Father, and we just pray for, we pray for peace, we pray for understanding, and uh, we pray that your hand would be upon everything that's going on. Continue to be with Alberta as they continue to fight these fires, that rain would send relief. And Father, now we just pray for Pastor Nathan as he brings the, your word to us. 
Prepare our hearts, Father. May your spirit be here working among us, for we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. going to take a moment and get uh, get a bit set up here and grab a, this and I can there we go all right perfect well as Rodney said uh, this is the point in our service where we're going to turn to God's word to see what it has to uh, say to us and why it matters for our lives today. And uh, as we do that, I uh, even though Rodney just prayed, I want to invite you to quickly pray with me again uh, as we go to God's Word. So Father, uh, as we come uh, before you to hear your Word and submit to it, I pray that you would send forth your truth and your light. Make your way known to us uh, through this passage so that we may follow it. Uh, we pray that you would give us wisdom and insight and most of all, love. In Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. Well, I want to start this morning by inviting you to exercise your imaginations with me. I want you to imagine a community where the spiritual gifts that we've been talking about and learning about throughout this series so far are active and flourishing. Even if you have no background in Christianity or you've missed the past few weeks or you've never really heard of spiritual gifts before, just imagine this kind of church with us uh, for a moment. In this church community, uh, the Spirit often gives people special insight, wisdom, or knowledge. At times, some people receive special messages for others, and when they share these messages, uh, they lead to breakthroughs in the other person's life. And so in this community, the Spirit is regularly giving messages of knowledge and wisdom for others. In this community, there's also healings and miraculous powers. When people pray for cancer and other illnesses to go, they often go. When people pray for God to provide, God often meets their needs. When people pray for a car that won't start to start, it starts. The Spirit powerfully answers prayer with miracles and healings in this community. And in this community, there's also prophecy. Certain members of the community are given powerful messages that challenge the world to turn back to God. They can see how God is working around them for either judgment or reconciliation. These prophets have a spirit-led ability to rebuke evil and shine light on the good around them. And so the Spirit has given people in this community the gift of prophecy. In this community, there are also gifted administrators. The Spirit gives people the ability to organize people around certain tasks to accomplish their mission. With these administrators, the Spirit has also gifted various people in the community to be helpers. These people are willing to sign up time after time after time again to get things done. The gifts of administration and helping are alive and active in this church. And in this community, there are also people who can speak in foreign tongues. And there are also people who can interpret those languages, even though they've never learned them. As the community gathers together, these people pray in these foreign tongues, while others interpret them. Through this process, the church hears from God in an undeniably supernatural way. And so to summarize all of this, in this community, the Spirit works in all of these diverse ways. Some people have supernatural knowledge and wisdom. People are miraculously healed by prayer. 
Powerful miracles of other kinds are also happening. Prophets proclaim God's challenges to those around them. Through gifted administrators and helpers, the whole community can organize and accomplish its one mission. And a variety of people can pray in spiritual tongues while others can interpret them. This is a community that regularly uses and practices the spiritual gifts. Now, we may think that that would be the ideal church. What could be more exciting than being part of a community like this? A community where the spiritual gifts were the norm. And yet this morning, I want to show you a superior way. Over the past month or so, we've been working our way through a series called Spirit-Led, Living by God's Power. In this series, we've been exploring the topic of spiritual gifts, the ways that the Spirit of God gifts his people. And in his first letter to the Corinthian church, Paul gives the longest teaching on spiritual gifts in the New Testament. He begins in chapter 12 by assuring the Corinthians that he doesn't want them to be uh, ignorant about these things. And so over the next chapter, he teaches them. He teaches them how all the spiritual gifts are given by the same Spirit. How the purpose of the spiritual gifts is for the common good of everyone. And how the diversity of these gifts is a good thing to be celebrated. And yet Paul ends the first chapter of his teaching on spiritual gifts with a bit of a surprising twist. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 31, Paul writes, Now eagerly desire the greater gifts. And we might think that Paul would stop there. But then he adds this final statement, the twist. He writes, And yet I will show you the most excellent way. And as we'll see today, that most excellent way is the way of love. In the middle of Paul's teaching on these spiritual gifts, in chapters 12 and 14, he devotes an entire chapter to the way of love. And so this morning we're going to work our way through this chapter, 1 Corinthians 13, to learn about the most excellent or superior way we'll see that as important and good as the spiritual gifts are, what is even more important is love. In order to do that, we're going to read out 1 Corinthians chapter 13 in three sections. And we'll begin by reading 1 Corinthians 13 verses 1 to 3 from the NIV translation. So here's what Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 13. If I speak in tongues of men or angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith that can move the mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship, that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Without love, we are nothing. Love is what is most essential for the way of the church. Love is needed. Love is necessary. That is Paul's clear point throughout these verses. And yet, it is a challenge to a lot of the modern church today. Let's just begin by dwelling on some of the things that Paul mentions in these verses for a moment. In verse 1, he talks about speaking in tongues. Whether that's in different human languages or angelic languages, whatever those might be. The gift of tongues is often seen by some Christians, I should say, as a mark of superior spirituality. 
according to some, speaking in tongues is evidence that you've received a second blessing of the Holy Spirit. It's a supernatural ability that cannot be possible by human effort alone. And yet, if we speak in these tongues, but don't have love, the sounds we make, Paul says, are useless. They're just noise. Without love, our speaking in tongues, if we have that gift, would count for nothing. In verse 2, Paul mentions understanding all mysteries and all knowledge. Just imagine having supernatural insight into all of those confusing parts in the Old Testament. Imagine having supernatural insight into the ways of God, why he allows certain things to happen and all his purposes. Imagine knowing what God would want you to do in every situation. Even if you have all of that knowledge, Even if you understand all of those mysteries, without love, that knowledge would count for nothing. In the same verse, Paul also talks about faith that can move mountains. In the song, What Faith Can Do by Cutlass, uh, the writer of the song puts it this way, Life is so much more than what your eyes are seeing. You will find your way if you keep believing. I've seen dreams that move the mountains, hope that doesn't ever end, even when the sky is falling. I've seen miracles just happen, silent prayers get answered, broken hearts become brand new. That's what faith can do. I mean, imagine having a faith like that. It would certainly be inspiring. And yet, without love, it would count for nothing. And in verse 3, Paul gives two more examples. Even if we give everything we have to the poor, even if we're willing to suffer and die for our faith, without love, it counts for nothing. Whatever our gifting, whatever our knowledge, whatever our previous actions, if we don't have love, they count for nothing. This is Paul's point in these opening verses. Love is the necessary and superior way. The reason that this message is so important for the church today is because we often reverse these things. We get it backwards. We prop up preachers because of their gifts, despite their lack of love. We value a political commentator because of their knowledge, even if they're hateful with it. We ignore a person's lack of love because of what they've already accomplished. When I was younger, I got caught up in this. Uh, As a teenager and a young adult, I used to listen to a pastor named Mark Driscoll. He was the pastor of a church named Mars Hill. Now, for some of you, that name might mean a lot, and you already know where this is going. But for others of you, you might have no idea who I'm talking about. So in case you don't know about Mark Driscoll, uh, here's the long story short. He is an extremely gifted communicator. He was engaging and clear, especially for a younger man like myself. He came across as very knowledgeable, and he planted a huge church that grew from Uh, the ground up to have over 15,000 members. But so much of his ministry did not have love. Talking about those who had been hurt and left uh, the church because of Mark Driscoll and his ministry, Driscoll once said this, I am all about blessed subtraction. There is a pile of dead bodies behind the Mars Hill bus. And by God's grace, there will be a mountain by the time we're done. You're either on the bus or you get run over by the bus. Those are the two options. There was no love for those who were run over by the bus. There was no concern for those who were being spiritually manipulated, bullied, and abused by Mark 
Driscoll. And yet at the time, Driscoll got a pass from so many people, including me during my teenage years, because of his gifts, his knowledge, and his success. I didn't realize that without love, those things count for nothing. Whatever our gifting, whatever our knowledge, whatever our actions, if we don't have love, they count for nothing. Love is the necessary and superior way. Let's move on to the next section of 1 Corinthians 13. Next, we'll read verses 4 to 7. And this time, I'll read from the First Nations Version. Here's what it says. Love is patient and kind. Love is never jealous. It does not brag or boast. It is not puffed up or big-headed. Love does not act in shameful ways, nor does it care only about itself. It is not hot-headed, nor does it keep track of wrongs done to it. Love is not happy with lies and injustice, but truth makes its heart glad. Love keeps walking, even when carrying a heavy load. Love keeps trusting, never loses hope, and stands firm in hard times. Love might be the superior way, but what does the superior way look like in practice? What is love? 1 Corinthians 13 verses 4 to 7 give us a pretty good answer to that question. Now, most of us will probably recognize these uh, verses as the wedding Bible passage. I think it was probably read out at my and mine and Sabrina's uh, wedding, and there's nothing, it wasn't? Oh, okay, never mind. Uh, it's definitely been read out at weddings that I've attended before. Are you sure? Yes. Oh, okay, anyway. Uh, <laughs> well, if it had been read out in our wedding, there would have been nothing wrong with that. Uh, and there's nothing wrong with it if it was read out at your wedding. At the same time, though, uh, I hope you can see that Paul's main focus here isn't on romantic uh, love and marriage. It's about the church community. We know this from just the bigger context of this chapter Remember, 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and 14 are instructions for how spiritual gifts should be practiced in the church community. And chapter 13 applies to that same group. Love is the most excellent way for the church community. And so the love, de the love described here is for all of us. It should be the way that we strive to be with one another. As Jesus says in John chapter 13, verse 35, By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. So what does the way of love look like? The first thing we might realize about love from these verses is that the way of love is the way of action. This is especially clear if you were reading these verses in their original language. In Greek, there are 43 words in these verses, and 15 of them are verbs. So that's a lot of verbs for 43 words. In other words, love must be lived. It's active. Love is something you do. If you love, it means you will protect, trust, hope, and persevere. It means you won't boast, dishonor, and envy. Love is only biblical love if it is lived in action. And we already know this. If I never did anything with or for Sabrina, then most people wouldn't agree that I loved her. Love has to be lived out in marriage, and love also has to be lived out in the church. Now, from here, there 
are a few different ways we could approach this kind of list. Uh, the first way we could approach it is by looking at the things that love does or is one by one. For example, we could talk about how love does not keep track of wrongs. When people fail us, we might be tempted to use the, that failure to our advantage. We might use their failure as ammunition in an argument. I know I've been guilty of that before. Or we might keep a list of ways that someone has wronged us, thinking that puts them in our debt. Like they owe us something because of the way that they've wronged us or the ways that they've failed us. But love doesn't do that. Love does not use past hurt as ammunition in arguments. Love doesn't remind people of their past failure and then say, so you owe me. Love doesn't hold grudges. Love does not keep track of wrongs. Instead, love forgives. So taking each thing on its own is one way we could approach this list. But the other way we could approach it is by looking at the whole list together. Uh, after all, when Paul first wrote this letter and sent it to the Corinthian church, the reader almost undoubtedly would have just read the list uh, without stopping to explain every item. And when we take the list together, here's what I think we get. It's a bit abstract, but love is not an action that's oriented towards ourselves. It's an action oriented toward the good of others. In other words, love does not point to us. That's why Paul says love does not envy, or love does not boast, or love is not proud, and love is not self-seeking. Love doesn't have us as its focus. Instead, love points towards others. It is patient and kind. It protects others. It trusts and hopes. Love is not selfish, it is towards the self of another. Paul explains love and Christian unity in similar terms in Philippians chapter 2. He says, make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. And then Paul explains that Jesus is the ultimate example of this love. Through his death on the cross, Jesus demonstrated a love that was for us. He died not because the cross benefited him, but because his death would benefit us. The superior way is the way of love. It is the way that seeks the best for others and is not centered on ourselves. It is the way of the cross of Christ. We're going to turn to the last section of 1 Corinthians 13. I'll read verses 8 to 13 from the NIV. Paul says, Love never fails, but where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when the completeness comes, what is in part disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put the ways of childhood behind me. For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, but I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these 
is love. In some ways, these verses might feel like a bit of a rabbit trail, but they're actually relevant for both uh, our sermon on love today and our series on spiritual gifts as a whole. Let me start with the big picture about love. The main point Paul is making in these verses is this. Love is permanent while the spiritual gifts will pass away. Therefore, love is the superior way. That's Paul's point in verse 8. He writes, love never fails, but where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, which is supernatural knowledge in context, it will pass away. And we can also see this in verse 13. Paul says that in the end, rather than spiritual gifts of tongues or prophecy, these three things will remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. And so the main point is pretty clear. Paul is still explaining why the way of love is the superior way. Love is the most excellent way because unlike the spiritual gifts, it will remain. Now, if I was just doing a one-off sermon about love, I'd probably stop there. After all, we've covered Paul's main point in this section. But the idea that the spiritual gifts will cease is pretty relevant for our sermon series as a whole. If the spiritual gifts have already stopped, then this whole series isn't very much more than an academic exercise it wouldn't really have any practical application for how we live as a church today, at least as far as I can tell. On the other hand, if the spiritual gifts haven't stopped yet, then a whole lot of what Paul says about spiritual gifts, including his command for us to pursue them, is relevant for us today. And so, we're going to take a brief moment, go down this rabbit trail, and explore this idea that the spiritual gifts will one day cease. And our main question is this. When Paul says that prophecies will cease, tongues will be stopped, and supernatural knowledge will pass away, when will that happen? Has it already happened? Or will it happen sometime in the future? Now, in one sense, the answer to this question is easy because it's in our text. In verses 9 and 10, Paul says, For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when the completeness comes, what is in part disappears. Now, the word uh, completeness in this verse could also be translated as perfection or the perfect. And so the verse could be translated as saying, When the perfect comes, what is imperfect will disappear. And in fact, I think that's probably the better way to translate it. And so if our question is, when will spiritual gifts cease? uh, Then here's the answer. When the perfect comes. But of course, that just begs the obvious question. What is the perfect? What is Paul talking about here? Well, there are generally two answers that Christians give to this question, and they result in two very different views about spiritual gifts. Some Christians believe that the perfect is the Bible, and because we have the Bible, then they believe that spiritual gifts have ceased already. Other Christians believe that the perfect is Jesus. In this view, spiritual gifts will cease when Jesus returns. Until that time, spiritual gifts will continue, spiritual gifts like prophecy and tongues. Now, there are various arguments and issues we could go through with both sides, and obviously we're not going to spend all of the time necessary to 
dive deep into all of these arguments and details this morning. So if you have uh, questions or pushback or want more details, uh, you can talk to me after the service. But for now, I'll simply make one point. The idea that the perfect refers to Jesus' return makes way better sense of verse 12. In the first half of verse 12, Paul says, For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. The key phrase for us uh, to think about this morning is the phrase face to face. When the spiritual gifts cease, when the perfect comes, then we will see face to face. Now I admit that this isn't super clear on its own, but here's the key point for us. Every time the phrase face to face occurs in the Bible, it involves living beings, uh, whether that's people, whether it's angels, or God himself. And I mean, that just makes sense if you think about it, right? You can't see a table face to face because tables don't have faces. Like this is, you know, just straightforward. And so the phrase is just never used in that way. It's always used to talk about two living beings. And no one in the ancient world thought that books or scrolls had faces either. The Bible never says Hannah opened the scroll and began to read it face to face. And so it seems like a pretty big stretch to think verse 12 refers to a seeing the Bible face to face. But on the other hand, it does make sense for it to say that we will see Jesus face to face when he returns. Now, whether that's a metaphor for knowing Jesus in a deeper way or whether it's literally talking about seeing Jesus face to face, Uh, I don't know for sure. My best guess is that it's probably both. But it is way more likely that the phrase we will see face to face refers to us meeting Jesus rather than being able to read the Bible. And so for this reason, as well as a lot of others I could go into, it just makes a lot more sense to interpret the perfect as being Jesus' second coming. And as a result, we should expect the spiritual gifts to continue today because, obviously, Jesus has not come back yet. They have not ceased and will not cease until Jesus' return. Okay, so now that we're done with that rabbit trail, as we finish our sermon this morning, we can get back to our main focus, the superior way. In the sermon series on spiritual gifts and living by God's power, it would be easy to think that the spiritual gifts are the best way forward. We wouldn't want to be part of a church, or or who wouldn't want to be part of a church where the sick are healed, where others are gifted with supernatural wisdom, and the Spirit gives the amazing capabilities for teaching, prophesying, and speaking in foreign tongues to other Christians. But in 1 Corinthians 13, Paul shows us the most excellent way. Now, don't get me wrong, spiritual gifts are still good. We should still pursue them as Paul commands. But the point is that the spiritual gifts are not the be-all and end-all. They are not our ultimate pursuit. Instead, the most excellent way is love. To be a community that visits the sick, even when miracles don't happen. To be a community that listens to the brokenhearted, even when we don't have a special word of wisdom to share. To be a community that serves the poor and the oppressed, even when we are not blessed with abundance whether we are using our spiritual gifts or not, the most excellent way is to be a community that lives love in action. And so as Paul transitions back to talking about spiritual gifts 
in the next chapter of his letter. He gives one command in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 1, to summarize the most excellent way. Pursue love. Perth Andover Baptist Church, let us not be a church that settles for the good but inferior way of spiritual gifts alone. Let us pursue the spiritual gifts, yes. But let us also be a church that also pursues the most excellent way, the way of love. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your love for us that you did not pull away from us, but that you turned toward us, that you have acted for our good in Jesus Christ. Give us the same love, a love that is kind, a love that is patient and is selfless for the good of others. Put it in our hearts to pursue the most excellent way, the way of love. In Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. All right, let's stand together and sing this really fun hymn, They Will Know We Are Christians By Our Love. forgetting that I don't have to step up to that mic anymore. When Jesus was asked uh, and challenged about the greatest command, he said, the greatest command is to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And the second is like it. Go and love your neighbor as yourself. This week as you go, may you follow the superior way, the superior way of love. Amen.